Pinelli Fernando. Welcome to my Atharamadhyava channel. I'm so happy to have you because our connection goes back years. At one point, both of us worked at the English department at the University of Sri Jayadunapura. Funnily enough, both of us have left that space. Now you are a senior lecturer at Kalanir, the English department. And I have been following your work for quite some time, Dinali. And what has fascinated me and what I want you to speak about here is the fact that you're one of the people who speak of a Sri Lankan English. Now, what I will ask you is, is there something like that? If so, what does that mean? Like, what are its characteristics? Because one thing I found here, I am now in the Department of English Language Teaching. So, in fact, even more than you, I encounter some attitudes which I think are quite harmful in the field of English language teaching. Maybe not in campuses, but maybe outside. If you take a look at what's happening within the tuition field or the posters or the advertisement, we still seem to think that our mission is to be praised by maybe white-skinned people. I have seen advertisements where, you know, the 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 little girl who speaks English gets petted on the head by, by tourists, as if that's the idea, right? And very often when I speak of a Sri Lankan English, I have had comments saying, what do you mean? You know, our job is not to speak like Sri Lankans, but to speak to people away. And I, 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 I sometimes wonder how many of us are actually speaking to people away from Sri Lanka, because we have a community of English speakers here. So a lot of complications like that, Dinali, and mainly social. So shall I just, um, with that very brief introduction, ask you, uh, Dinali, is there anything called Sri Lankan English, according to your opinion? It's a very good question, Madhu, and thank you for having me on this program. Uh, as you know, we have been friends for a long time, and I think uh, we've kind of worked on this issue in two different ways almost. Uh, so to answer your question, uh, actually, it sounds like a very simple, straightforward question, but it's not. It's quite a complicated, very layered question. Uh, so very simply, there are social linguistic descriptions of what Sri Lankan English is and what it can be. So in uh, language studies, we usually identify uh, differences in languages in terms of linguistic features like the accent and the, the pronunciation, which we call phonology, then the words, the vocabulary, then, then the grammar and the syntax. And then even things like pragmatics, which is how language um, functions in actual situations. So uh, when this conversation about different varieties of English started about 50 years ago, and I think the, we can, uh, it uh, comes in under this study, uh, uh, broad area of uh, discipline, we could call it, uh, called World Englishers. This in plural, no, Dylan, in, in the plural, Englishers. Englishers, Englishers in plural. exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you for reminding mm -hmm. me of that very, very important uh, distinction. So when we say uh, this is Sri Lankan English, when this is British English or this is American English, we refer to, uh, to begin with, we might be referring to just one, one variety of English that is spoken there. As you know, there are many British Englishers, American Englishers. And more and more, we are looking at Sri Lankan English as right. multiple. And generally, what we forget is what we call correct English is actually a very provincial, London-based oh, yeah. thing. And there was a lot of politics when they tried to standardize that as being the English. Exactly. Right? And we have forgotten, you know, the past where the British people themselves were fighting into what is the good standard. English because you have Cockney accents and whatever, which normally now, I mean, naturally they fell into a hierarchy of not so posh accents. Exactly. Right? And there yeah. was there was so much politics in England before this was standardized. And that was linked to printing, if I'm correct, Dinali. Yes, because I think this goes back to Thomas Caxton, the, uh, the, yes. who invented the printing press and that made, uh, you know, text ac accessible in more than one copy. Yes. And then they realized there's so much regional variation in words, in spelling, 
etc there had to be some kind of uniformity standardizing so it's not the, the origin, actual origins is not to say correct or incorrect but to make it accessible to all by going by one a uh, unit you know making something very amorphous very different into something uniform that everyone exactly. could kind of it was a very pragmatic decision for the printer yes. to have it easy the accent was not so much connected to printing but probably when one yeah. variety was considered standard the accent also would naturally have become like the accepted exactly uh, but i think the politics of it was ever divorced from the process as rightly pointed out the original regional dialect that that was standard english was the educational and commercial uh, power base of england you know that triangle of london um, oxford and cambridge so that's where you know the courts were, the uh, commercial hub as well as the seats of learning were so and the people naturally uh, the that, that variety was selected as the uniform variety not like the representatives yeah. and also then a little moment you say oxford and cambridge we are also talking wealth right you are also of talking class because you wealth, couldn't political uh, power yeah, yeah. you could not enter those uh, hallowed halls of learning if you didn't have money so just like in sri lanka it's connected with wealth english itself in england maybe the regional a uh, dialect that was used as the standard had a connection with perhaps wealth even from the beginning right of course political power wealth education everything yes mm -hmm. but what's interesting is that that uh, even in the world english studies that is called standard english without much nuance you know without really uh, looking at, at, as this you know uh, discrete simply uh, you know simple category and here also we refer to, we talk about standard english as if it's in opposition to our local variety you know we might speak standard english that is good but if you speak sri lankan english that might be a bit you know not so acceptable and there are lots of as you said misconceptions about you need to speak standard english and not sri lankan english in order to enter the uh, enter the the corporate sector world if you want to a job in the private sector you have to speak standard english Yeah, and is, and and the 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 thing there is generally even people in the corporate sector must might be using what you call Sri Lankan English without even realizing that. But of course know, they do. Yeah. The images, we are the ones speaking proper English, so it's a kind yeah, of and I don't think ironic position. To be honest, I don't think the corporate, the leaders of the corporate sector even promote anything called standard exactly. English and say, yeah. I, "Young graduates, you know, you have to speak standard English and not English." Right. Very pragmatic yeah. in their language needs, you know. I mean, I've had uh, conversations with corporate corporate sector people who say we are not even bothered about English. They will learn it. We yes. want the skills. Yeah. Mm. And of course, we make generalizations, especially at campus, about this corporate sector. You no, know, we think it's this one. <laughs> one group that thinks they like it's a huge base no i mean that it, it's it's a huge and varied base varied base yes. yes yeah hmm. so this uh, i don't know whether i answered your question no, but i it, think i complicated it no no i i the complications is exactly what i want people being made aware of generally where we question things that we don't normally question so yes. this thing about englishers world englishers came into prominence With what? Oh, at what time, Dinali, and what were the causes of it? Did oh, good point. I think we can trace it back to Braj Kachru, who yeah. was actually a, a Kashmiri American academic who was writing about uh, varieties of English from the sixties, I believe. And it's to him that we can credit uh, these uh, the the like the what they call the nation-based labels, like Sri Lankan English, Indian English. i remember in the uh, in the 60s we were still part of very much you know the colonial hangover and uh, he realized you know what we see as uh, and the language teaching world was also still very much dominated by uh, you know standard british english uh, american english and he he talked about the fact that you know what we see as uh, what is uh, different in the way we speak you know coming from our local cultures because by this time english had become a local language with the, in all the post colonial uh, countries but still anything that uh, suggested some kind of local influence was seen as a bit 
you know well, that uh, is there so dinali but if you if someone is interested in reading raj khatru what would you suggest dinali which articles which books to get an idea of the Actually, way it started yeah, uh, well he has uh, two books i think uh, the alchemy of english where english is his magical thing if you learn it uh, you know you have magical powers yes. that's one and the other one i like is um, uh, a collection by him uh, which is um, the other tongue it's called the other tongue these are published in the 80s and even earlier i think uh, uh, the other tongue is the book i have i haven't read uh, read the alchemy of english but there is a lot of writing going on now you know in the last couple of years 2021 2022 there were two handbooks if i'm not mistaken another one is on the way on world englishers you know the one i have here i thought i'll share i'll show the book because this is one i've borrowed this from uh, harshana ramukwella thanks harshana <laughs> so this is the rutledge handbook of world englishers this was first published in 2010 and this is the second edition that was published in 2021 wow. and that it has an a- article Is it is it available in the British Council or any place? Dinali, do you know? Probably, it's probably yeah. available, and um, I don't know. That I should say this. Yeah, you can download it. I have the soft copy. Okay, well. okay. Unless yeah. Harshana makes his library public, because I also keep using his library for books. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> others need to. Uh, others need to get their hands. No, but uh, I know Kalaniya Library has the okay. latest edition, the the PDF, the the ebook. the ebook because we are into buying i will also yeah. check that and maybe we can you know public library or some people can recommend something so that's great yeah. okay a uh, braj khatru uh, dinali i'm going to spell that name because one of the things i like doing in my program is to actually get people to follow up if possible okay because for example they may not have access to you generally sometimes right right can you tell me whether i spell this b r a j right okay right. so yeah. and um, i love this uh, word the alchemy of english yeah yeah i can have uh you do you think this is available here probably is in the university libraries you might get it british council might have it have it and no, uh, actually the american center library might have it because he is technically american that's uh, it the american center, center might have it no what was other one you said uh, the the other the other tongue at the tang it has another tagline i can't remember right so yeah. he is kind of one of the seminal people and what you just originally yes. right. now of course there's a second generation of uh, world english uh, world english experts who are still writing and right and some interesting stuff is happening yeah lots yeah. of descriptions of new english is coming up yeah lovely okay so this kind of conversation dinali something which i always bring up when i speak to others about it this kind of conversations that we are having you know we have it in english yeah so it automatically you know we are always almost always preaching to the converted yeah like lots, always, of, <laughs> lots of english, people are uh, speaking english also are very conservative about uh, that is uh, language differences so that is true. Uh, but, but the fact is really we won't be talking to people like that probably not on this subject i guess not yeah so that's the thing so my thing is has anyone ever done any i know this is not a fair question for you but is anyone writing in singhal about these issues you think dinali not as far as i know madhu you are right and it's a big uh, failing <laughs> it's a big lack in our, in, yeah. in in the conversation Even, right arjuna parakrama's superb book the hegemonizing language standard it's still only in english no yeah true while as those who would really benefit by knowing what he says might not be that that crowd yeah that's and, Yes, you were speaking about characteristics that you know make something a bit different from the standard English. Would you list them kind of slowly, Dinali, and also give us an example from Sri Lankan English that you can find? Okay. Uh, so uh, as I said, these language linguistic characteristics cut across grammar, grammar and syntax, vocabulary, pronunciation, all that, and even how we you know combine. uh suffixes prefixes and make up words so you do get good li- vocabulary lists in uh, for example in um, michael mailer's dictionary of uh, sri lankan english which has over 2000 words actually and he you have uh, that book with you i do 
I knew you'd ask me about the books, so I have them <laughs> in front you know of me. Know me very well. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that too. Yes. Michael yeah, probably Miller. have it. Yes. He's, Miller, a, yeah. he's a Britisher living in Sri Lanka, isn't he? He does he's quite British. Yeah. He's like more Sri Lankan than British because I think he spent more more of his life here than in England. Right. Yeah. And he does research on our language, right? Yes. Yeah. Sri Lankan. Then. And then Man Manik has done quite a lot as well. Manik has done as well. This is her book and this uh, preceded Michael's book. Yes. The Postcolonial Identity of Sri Lankan English and the chapters read, you know, um, phonology, the syntax, the morphological processes. And she talks about the politics of English. And she's one of the few people who kind of clearly identified uh, standard Sri Lankan English using the label standard Sri Lankan English and also by, def by default identifying errors as non-standard Sri Lankan English from a very social linguistic perspective. Uh, so none of these descriptions are actually uh, perfect, but as you know, when we try to describe things as complex as language, it you're opening other <laughs> problems. I and That's the thing. Yeah. One thing I worry about my channel is generally sometimes at the level we are discussing, uh -huh. may, it may simplify things which are inherently not simple. Right. You know, so that's a choice I had to make whether I should not talk about it at all or try to talk in single and at least get some things right. which are not normally discussed. So that's a choice and Hobson's choice. I don't think there is... Uh, like whether yeah. it's better not to know about these things or know it at a simplified standard. So yeah. that was the decision I had to take. You know, right. you use the word errors here, right? Yeah. Errors, again, I'm putting the rabbit here. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. But, but see now, what we might call Sri Lankan English, if you're looking at it from a very conservative standard perspective, might even be thought an error, right? I think they all originally were. If you look at that, um, Passe, Dr. Passe, Che Passe, who, Professor Passe, sorry, mm -hmm. who first wrote about Ceylon English, this thing called Ceylon English, and that was his PhD in the 1940s, which he did at the University of London. And then a book came out based on it in 55 called, um, 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 I can't remember the name right now, uh, but uh, in, in that, uh, He's one of the few people to say, okay, these are so frequently used by all Sri Lankans, even the people who speak very, you know, those days it was, you know, they spoke something that was much closer to British English than we speak now. But even them in different contexts, particularly in informal, uh, uh, friendly contexts, would use these words. And just because it's not understood by other speakers elsewhere doesn't mean that it's wrong. At the same time, if you're a teacher of English, you know, you know, if you spell cat with a K, it's wrong. Uh, and uh, if you say, uh, you know, hat for cat, that uh, might be considered wrong. But at the same time, now we are veering into uh, variation because in Tamil phonology, her and her are interchangeable. So a Tamil child learning to speak might say hat for cat and cat for hat. Uh, okay, so that's another you know conversation about different Englishes. So this idea of errors, I think what uh, we are, the idea of errors comes from language teaching and second language acquisition, which made you know it's a second language acquisition particularly is a very cognitive way of looking. You know, they looked at how language and the mind, but uh, looking at variation as you know um, uh, as uh, as natural and as how people express their own realities, different people express their different realities differently, is a much more social Dinali, uh, you know, descriptive versus prescriptive approaches. Exactly. So, and the, so uh, prescriptive approach is now kind of frowned upon. Upon in general, yeah. In general. Yeah. I just want to go back to this uh, error and the continuum and ask you what pigeon means. Okay, pigeon is another story which has some overlaps with things like world English. So pigeons uh, are languages that uh, emerge in very specific contexts, like uh, where a lot of different uh, languages, it's a very highly multilingual context, where, uh, and where a lot of different people speaking different languages are kind of thrown together where they have to speak to each other. 
So this is like in um, harbor, uh, in harbor towns, you know, in port towns, etc., where you might have. So, for example, uh, uh, in uh, pigeons have grown up in when uh, we had pigeons, if you like. I mean, they have. So once a, a pigeon gets uh, uh, is spoken for two generations, it becomes a creole because it becomes the mother tongue of the children of the pigeon speakers' children. When the pigeon is not even formed, even at the beginning of forming it, would those be considered errors? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even, a, now. yeah. even now. Even no? now, so from even errors, now because... errors being a standardized language is the process that creates a pigeon and then a creole, right? Yeah, it's basically, the thing is, uh, the concept of errors is uh, becomes very powerful when we are talking about uh, Formal language learning context, I think. This is language learning in the natural environment. That's, see, this is, this is what yeah. I want you... That, that's a, I'm very happy you made that point, Dinali, because so many Sri Lankans are scared of errors. Yeah, because yeah, they, it, they'll think it, of it, English it, as something in the classroom, no? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, because we come down on errors like a ton of bricks. And, exactly. you know, in the natural world, in, in Sri Lankan society, we laugh at errors so, you know, so sarcastically and so yeah. strongly. And the fear of making an error is, I think, what's preventing people from using it, thereby learning it properly to actually. I guess it. so. Yeah, definitely. And I've come. Uh, you know that I teach uh, teach uh, young children in a voluntary capacity sometimes. Um, well, not sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I teach this class of O level children, and I can see the students who are actually good in school you know they come in the first five, five or ten uh, positions and um, they probably do well in the exams at school english also because it's very much a written test they are the most scared to speak whereas i have children who are like almost drop out their parents are probably you know alcoholics who don't really care whether these children go to work or not they are much more spontaneous when it comes to speaking so i think it's this Absolutely. and i think yeah. the ego factor Finally, the ego, the moment the ego, because once you're a good student, your ego then... Yes, you, know, like, you don't like, want to have like, anything marked right, wrong. Right, in right, right. So yeah. they have so many breaks to make sure that that ego side of you is not hurt. And they yeah. may the risk taking must be really... Yeah, uh, and actually uh, only last week I was kind of giving them this little sermon saying, you can't learn English without taking risks. You can't learn a language without making mistakes. So don't worry about the crosses in your in your book it's a process of learning and they were looking at me like you know uh, what are you talking about because they are so conditioned to thinking errors as a sign of non-learning or even going backwards and not the part are, of the process no not a part of the process of learning. that's also education system isn't it dinali uh, with uh, in uh, language learning it's global <laughs> yeah it's is, been, is it yeah it is because sla has been like that no this whole essay, the, the cognitive acquisition. acquisition, the cognitive approaches have seen errors as signs of non-learning. So that's why the... We have a list of it and we, yeah. we, we... Okay, but now since we're digressing a bit, do others also come down so hardly, other cultures? Like do Indians yes, laugh at... They yeah, do? They, they do, they do. I think it's a bit of a misconception when we think it's like we make these general comments like, oh, only Sri Lankans hold up. Uh, laugh at each other speaking English in India they don't in China they don't there's mm -hmm. enough research uh, to say is even in China you know China English is something that is have, has come up with you know China opening up in the last 20 years and a lot of research on China English the, you know descriptions of their vocabulary and then Chinese researchers have talked about it and uh, one lovely article I read they, they have you know very mocking metaphors that they use on uh, Chinese uh, students who are not speaking, I mean, Chinese people who don't speak good English. They call it, I can't remember the Chinese word, but things like, you know, outtakes, you know, taking the metaphor from uh, online uh, videos. They are, you are speaking without uh, editing the outtakes, you know, unedited speech, baby's, uh, uh, baby speech, you know, lots of uh, negative ne metaphors. So laughing at people, uh, uh, laughing at people speaking the elite prestigious language in any culture is not only in Sri Lanka. It's a general human trait, I think, because there's so much at stake. Yeah, right. Because I, I am one of those people who do th who do think that Sri Lankan, especially the, the the social 
world of Sri Lanka and the mm. kind of urban elite kind of people do laugh. We yeah, of course. Have... And I'm sure urban elite uh, Indians. But for example, laugh. in in France, would they be laughing like that? Well, well, the thing is, we express our uh, ridicule in different ways. No, I know in France, if you uh, uh, there is a lot of talk about how French people would not speak English with you, even if they know it, which is a complete uh, you know misconception because you go to Paris, everybody speaks in English. The policemen speak to you in English. You don't get anyone who's hostile to you because a foreigner doesn't speak in French to you. French, yeah. But if you make mis uh, and they would encourage you to speak French. I know if you if you're start, uh, tatamifying, tatamifying and speaking French, I mean, this is my experience 20 years ago, things may have changed now. Mm. They would encourage you. But I don't know whether she's laughing or not. She might have different, we might, she might go back home and say, ah, this brown person said this, ha 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 ha. I mm. think we are confronted with this. This is up close and personal when our people do it and we know the ramifications, we know the depths of it, but I think everybody laughs. I think that's the, but that, that doesn't mean it's a, it's always like that, you know? Similarly, I think here, there are lots of people who are really encouraging of people uh, to speak English, like you, you for instance. Now I can't imagine uh, a, a former year to you head in the last year, like, like say 40 years ago, doing this kind of channel in, thing, in uh, you know, bilingually. And also like the corporate sector of teachers uh, um, in any kind of workspace, I think not so proficient English or proficiency as we defined it in a very traditional way is not the norm anymore. But at the same time, uh, you know, young graduates are bilingual. They might speak better signal than, you know, the elite bi graduates from yeah. Peradenia in the 50s. So it's... Uh, I think it's very complex and we it's think... It's very complex. And another commonly said thing is like people are welcome to make mistakes in their mother tongue. It's kind of cute. Right. But not so in English. I so, don't think so at all. I think you are actually... Remember what happened to the mayor of Colombo, Rosie Senanaika, when she stumbled over some numbers? The ridicule was vicious. Mm. There was so much... Uh, and I... I personally feel you know like I said we've discussed before I'm not comfortable talking about this stuff uh, in Sinhala though Sinhala is my first language I teach all this linguistics in English so I have to kind of really think about uh, the terminology etc yes. that's because I'm scared of being ridiculed <laughs> right and the ridicule also mm, yeah because one of the reasons Linali, I called my channel in between space is because you know, all of us are aware of a mutual dislike of those who don't know English towards those who know. And some of us who know English might not think uh, that well of those who may not know English. So to kind of have a middle space. Right. But you're telling me that that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. No? Not yeah, all. I'm also people. wondering if things have changed now, Martha, because maybe the time I was a student on camp campus in the 80s, Mm -hmm. There was a fairly clear distinction between the students in the English department, the Kadu faculty, the way we dress, the way we talk, the way we, uh, how, who we hung out with. And even, you know, uh, the socioeconomic backgrounds we came from, we were certainly urban. You know, everybody wasn't rich, but we were urban English speaking class. Now you can't identify. You know, you get really nice um, urban, posh looking girls doing singer and boys doing singer. Eh? When you see them in a crowd, they don't normally stand out. And English department has, I mean, we have much bigger numbers also. And we have students, uh, I think maybe one or two coming from Colombo and Colombo schools. Everybody comes from, you know, Kurunagala, Gaul, Kalutara, Matara, Badul, uh, Anuradhapura, all these areas, Chilau. Yeah. I hope you're right. Yes. I think, yeah. We have to. We have to. Because this yeah, is how yeah. the world is going. True, have to and whether it is happening is the... Um... Yeah, that's also true, but I think it's changed. It's yeah, subtle, I it's just, slow. I know yeah. this is not, not part of our language at all, but if you take ragging, for example, the dress code is clearly 20 years ago thing, that hasn't changed, no? No, it has changed. Mark <laughs> now our campus... Ah, okay. Kalani, I think, is a bit... Uh, but Kalani like, has changed. In those days, our dress code was, you know, long gathered skirt. I mean, we didn't have a dress code, but we kind of conformed to what, uh, mm -hmm. what we thought will, uh, you know, <laughs> anonymize us. 
but then the dress code was you know long skirts for the girls with two flats you know mm. but now the only uh, and this is very sinister because it has parallels with nazi germany and all the only thing the first years are asked to wear is a white wool in there the the scrunchie has to be white they can wear anything <laughs> tight jeans t-shirts crop tops anything no oh, okay That's we are not there yet yeah. didly <laughs> if i have yeah. to believe yeah i don't think so that's what i'm saying from where i stand yeah there's a look as if thing the thing is see i in a way i'm not suitable to come in because when i got into colombo campus it was the height of jvp troubles and i went to india so i never actually had the undergraduate yeah. experience right so but from what i can yeah. see as a lecturer and the the codes that you know you you still have the thing of you can't wear three quarters and all that which i personally saw recently and things seem yeah. doesn't seem to have changed there are in kalani i know you all went to court and got the three quarter thing taken away oh, so really? I, <laughs> i i check so no, this I'm is interesting is, because you no, know our... I'm, yeah i'm saying is dinali what i see now and you ask them who made the rule they have no idea no, and they are like this is for the good of everybody and yeah. we did and first thing we didn't make the rule yeah. so you know the lack of questioning the lack of doing things where they are, where they are doing it so the, the way this is linked to english is because i'm wondering about your comment whether things have changed i think uh, these are all manipulations no i mean uh, i think uh, ragging is like another whole topic you no, can another another topic all together yes <laughs> I I'm I'm think it to whether things have changed kind of okay thing. right to dress because the dress code is clearly not what you would expect an english speaker to follow okay right at at the that's the link to our discussion here okay yeah. right right okay. so i think this also shows there's a multiplicity of you know performing <laughs> what is <laughs> you know language language prestige and i mean even the ragging incident shows no that two different two uh, state universities in fairly close proximity to each other in the western province have different uh, exactly you know, yeah. different. i guess it also depends on who actually works there no I who you have that. and how 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 the lecturers also take a stand so I, i'm sure that also factors in That's and also finally i wanted to tell you that um, the a person i think now i can't generalize javadanpur as either right when i, I started the um, when i was the head we started a two hour every day 8 to 10 english program no? and we made it credit course and i actually expected people to protest right because suddenly we were putting in and that thanks to the vice chancellor and the dean and the amazing support of the faculty something that was you know the you were at japura yeah. right yeah. something that wasn't considered very serious suddenly when this high and 8 to 10 english nobody else did any lecture and credit course so suddenly failing that means your credit is affected right. i actually expected posters like what the heck and you know the poster that finally came out at the end of that year i actually have reproduced that in my book <laughs> is apita ingrisi madhya nigana ganimata aithiya diyao wow yeah for me to have expected posters yeah. against me and everybody else yeah. for bringing english to the fore like that and making sure eight to 10 it's compulsory you come and having the whole batch sit the english class together we divided mm. it into 17 and every lecture i had to clear their timetable for the first year till 10 yeah. so imagine no, i think the student body as a body has never rejected english uh, the yeah. english that they can learn at campus it's just that you know systemically it has not been done very well i think madhu what you did at japra is transformational you know it's revolutionary and i always talk about what you have done and nobody has that kind of you know it's also being about who you are being in the right place at the right time with the right and support, support. Yeah. and the right, right support dinali because the vice chancellor dean down to the faculty if they exactly. hadn't supported none of these could this is what surprises me all of us recognize the need for this yeah. but unless the admin makes a decision to help because you even do it, other yeah. department other university people have said how how did everyone support you and we got money for free textbooks to each student dinali mm. so that the material problem which is like a you know those things are possible that was yeah, it wasn't funded by any world but whatever 
No, it was just campus people doing what they could. We made the books and they gave the money to print them. And every single student carried their textbook, which took away our need for continuous, you know, how do we get the material across mm -hmm. kind of distance. Yeah. So it, it's possible. So, so that was said to show that, yes, I also may have generalized some things which didn't turn out to be the case. Mm. So, no, it, I mean, you speak from your own context no, and we are right. famous. It is fair, so, yeah. which is what I'm also doing. Right. So let's get back to um, our discussion. So Dinali, now within the university context, we discuss these things. But if you take like the private tuition or the private education sector, mm -hmm. we still don't seem to really, they still don't seem to understand many mm -hmm. things. For example, I have seen YouTube uh, lessons where they actually teach the accent, the American or the British accent. Yeah. What's happening there? It's very interesting. And I think thanks to COVID, we're actually getting a glimpse into what goes on in these uh, speech classes and private tuition, mass uh, uh, spoken English classes. And, you know, occasionally people send me these videos, say, what do you think? This is horrendous what they're doing and all. And I always kind of take a step back to see what is actually going on. And it's also very interesting, very complex, very complex because as you said, they are, uh, they are uh, actively teaching American or uh, uh, to be a little sarcastic, it's a kind of a perversion of an American plus uh, British accent, which is the only defining feature seems to be it is not a Sri Lankan accent. Yeah, I've, I've heard Australian as well, mate. Right, okay. So imagine how alien that sounds. Yeah, and it's not only really accents, it's like, you know, uh, conversational gambits, like, uh, don't say, no, I have this lovely uh, sports that I, uh, I found and I use it with my uh, postgraduate students also. Where it says, this is, uh, this is old English, this is post English. So to say, hello, how are you is old English. In other words, you are aged and it's out of date. I sometimes but, wonder whether we are being trolled or whether they actually believe in stuff like that. I think they are because they are from actual genuine authentic classes to which people pay and join. But I don't know. Uh, the thing is, we also sometimes, more, many te teachers think our students are a bit dumb look. We don't realize the students. That's another, that's, that's another thing I'll get to later, Dinali, like how we have connected English and yeah. intelligence. But let, let's that's get intelligence, to this. Yeah, this blessed yeah, so posh it's word, also like, yeah, the posh word irritates me no end. So posh is an English No, because you know what they're doing? Yeah. Yeah, the word, so also they are using posh without the connotations of the dictionary definition. Because if you use posh in a British, standard British English context, it means upper class. And be, unambiguously, it's upper class. But in the Sri Lankan context, posh can also mean chic and trendy and youthful. You know, it has those crowd. The witty crowd. No? The witty crowd, yes. yes. So let me, uh, I'll, I'll call you later. If uh, the posh version is, I'll hit you up. You know, that's a, so, so this say, is slang, this is contemporary that, slang. See, that bothers me a lot. Oh, the, 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 the concept of register exactly. is many people who do this, this is this, this is that. Yeah, exactly. I, have, I, I must actually speak about register as well. That there are ways you use a language which differs according to who you are speaking with, what the context is. So register exactly. completely goes away with these little charts. No? I know. And I'm very glad you mentioned register, Madhu, because even in the academic discourses on Sri Lankan English, sometimes we undermine, we don't talk enough about register. Because when we have word lists, even in uh, Michael's book and in Manik's word list, she has a word list of about 500. Uh, and the most horrendous there was uh, a newspaper saying he she hit the bucket or he hit the bucket. Some hit the bucket. Okay. About saying died or passed or whatever you say. Some word leader hit the bucket. And she actually oh. has a... I don't know. Really? She, that's from a newspaper. Oh. This is the thing, yeah. Yes, but... And also uh, learning the uh, the register variation is a higher level language learning skill, I suppose. Because and crucial, right? It's it is crucial. crucial. Yeah, it can. I mean, the, the, that kind of pragmatic mistake can lead to not, uh, I mean, uh, not using the right word to say cat or dog is very easily repairable because you can point to the animal or in the context it comes across. But if you call, uh, you know, in a something like a, a, a job interview, if you say something like, uh, hit me up later, 
you basically lost the job no you've not got it because you've offended people yes and that kind of that kind of um, breakdown of communication because of creating offense can be can have much more serious repercussions serious and, and and it's difficult to teach because that's about making them understand the particular culture the language is spoken about exactly. which is not easy to teach it's not easy to teach because yeah. you know the very very colloquial registers use slang and slang is very highly dynamic what is a hip slang term this year will be not used so in a way it's a very difficult area to encompass in into a curriculum because you like yeah. it. and, and also is it relevant if you is it relevant because slang yeah. especially is so culture bound what is slang in the uk we don't even have to bother with it so much right it's regional also yes. what is slang in different parts of, of the uk yeah, from the, yeah. that yeah. will also be different similarly yeah. i think yeah yeah and then Because to we, then social media to have those as you know by biblical word list exactly, is a bit yeah. disturbing and and that that's a sad part so in that sense if if there are teachers listening to us it's always safer to stick to the conventional yes there's yeah, a uh, because that will be safe anywhere you it's better to sound more formal in a normal situation than sound yeah. informal in a formal situation exactly. it's a very you know when a, we have a very hierarchical culture anyway exactly so that will be excused much quicker than someone trying to be familiar with people who may not want familiarity with, within that context like you said the interview exactly yeah so that that's a, so the this concept of register and again we need to have this discussion in singhala dinali where we you will find the word for register and have i will find it. the word for register <laughs> because we see the very fact that we both are wondering what would we call it means that we are not these discussions don't happen yeah. Yeah. and both of us deal very closely with singhala speakers yeah and register as a concept in singhala is much more much more obvious no because the katana singhala and the yes singhala, so, so that's different. more complicated but the yeah. these things so this is a, so again to go back to this kind of thing there's a lot of stereotyping also in in english teaching one of the things i mentioned in my writing is like take the posters okay. that tuition is advertised in say spoken english or whatever yeah They're always like with tie and coat and always yeah. a winner <laughs> attitude with like the is raised and you're a winner winner loser concepts comes very strongly i think oh that's a uh, the, the race metaphor that's interesting yeah, yeah. so and um, very often <laughs> i think it's a default mode image very often when you advertise english it's 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 a white skin person and i want oh, to yeah. people you don't become fairer just because you learn english yeah right? no one of our students the undergraduate the dissertations was uh, uh, she look uh, she did a visual analysis of english uh, fusion handbills and uh, oh, posters and yeah. it was called white skin english she called yeah. it white skin english you know and this is this i'm stepping away from english per se because some of our degree private campuses the final person with a degree is white and i'm like okay that's that's very clear really? <laughs> they yeah. must want i mean they have enough money not to use the default right okay. yeah. but the people holding a degree is a white person and i'm like you know please <laughs> english and okay so that skin that mm-hmm. colorism is a huge factor in our what do you call it the reverence of the west the second thing is dress mm, formal this, this is weird but i always get caught into like the devil in the deep blue sea when i say it. if you notice the girls who are in um, english speaking posters they are either in very short mini skirts and whatever yeah. now i have nothing against mini skirts right but i do have a problem with our assumption that if you learn english you also ch- change your dress yeah right and this yeah. has been like you become posh as a person yeah think about language it's about how you keep your hair and this mm. has been propagated through many ads like if you take fair and lovely which i actually show quite a lot the person who becomes fairer doesn't just become fairer with that her salva is replaced by a mini skirt a long hair and the tying of it is replaced by a very you know the the posh hair cut mm-hmm. and men also look at her so which means you get mm-hmm. it also so what i'm saying is we have combined so many mm. things with the concept of fairness which can be easily linked to 
Have you yeah. ever seen a dark person advertising in English language? No, no, no. no so, but sorry, you don't see many dark people advertising anything in this country. That's no? true. That's it's true. A, such that a huge is. thing if a dark-skinned person advertises uh, a beauty product. Yes. That's exactly. The whole idea of a beauty product is to become less dark. So, and how the colorism is a factor yeah. in English language okay. teaching and they are being used so much mm. in tuition classes as well. And right. I'm like, why don't they show a very traditional woman? Mm. I mean, I'm terrified of uh, showing my legs, so that is my personal problem, but they yeah. never show anyone like me, forget, I mean, at least when I was younger, <laughs> for that, uh, for the English speaking poster. Right. Because yeah. we are a not... normal, <laughs> average Sri Lankan. Sri Lankan, <laughs> yeah. right? And even a young, a younger Sri Lankan looking Sri Lankan in a sari or something never comes in an English poster. Yeah. And it's almost as if you are saying, if you are speaking English, you don't wear sari or you don't wear sarong. Mm, yeah. These things and so easily sellable, no? Yeah. So in a way, I'm stereotype. I'm sure there are others who don't do it. But in a, it's so easily linked, this kind of fairness and poshness with English. Yeah. English is, you can actually take that away. And do your thing. Okay. <laughs> really my final question. My, uh, see, when I talk about these things, today I'm talking with you, but I also say this quite often, and there are comments of the singhaling. Mona Mona Pisuda, Mona Mona the Sri Lanka, Vingrisi Kiani. Jema Deak at them and M. A. Ugul Danatna Nikang in the kind of thing. Okay. Right? So, what do you answer to them? It's like they have to start knowing it, or you just. What sounds? It's lack of knowledge, right? And these are things are not taught in schools anywhere. No, it's uh, once again, uh, so one thing, my uh, at one level, my answer would be English is a global language. When we talk about a, a, a idealized standard, we are saying, okay, this is the British English or American English that we should all conform to. You know, globally, we should all conform to that. Okay. So, it's humanly impossible because uh, English grows in your own uh, in your own ecology. You know, the English is used in Sri Lanka. It's Sri Lanka nice because we speak English in this country as one of our local languages. Uh, for example, if you go around your kitchen or your house there and talk about the things in your house, you can't do it without using borrowings from Sinhala and Tamil. Absolutely. And Sri Lankan coinages, you know, grinding stone, the miris galada, uh, you know, scraping coconut, or whatever. Uh, hansi, like a chair, like hansi 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 putua, exactly. Impossible because you don't say armchair for that. Well, you think, but that's a word, but an armchair and a real armchair. Is, and if you're thinking of, you know, the British English or standard English, armchair is something quite different. Something so quite different. It's, exactly. it's, it's a cushion chair. In yeah. our culture. With two arms. <laughs> With two arms. <laughs> in our culture, it'll be like a sofa or something. Yes. But, yeah, so, yeah, so I, I have used Hansi put in my novel and I think I got pulled up for that too. Oh, really? Why? Why wouldn't you like so? Okay, why didn't you say arm? Again, yeah, again, again, politics, no, we don't expect them to figure out what this word is. Yes. Right? All of us are looking up daffodils. Exactly. And in, school. and in uh, in creative writing, you see, no, I mean... Uh, uh, the the leave the global figures like Rushdi and all they use Indian English for, for dialogues etc dialogues and even some of their you know uh, their na narrative and they borrow language from at least ten different languages I think but there is no glossary at the end of the book saying there this isn't. is this this is there isn't. so yeah. Indian writers have really made it big. Yeah. yeah, and and so have the young African writers, generally. Yes, of course. Not just young, even from yeah. way back, yeah. then the African writers do. And I think now I um, Amanda Jaitis's novel, the international some thriller award winning novel. I I, I haven't read it, but my my child did, and she said there's a lot of Sri Lankanism. Oh really? They're proudly, they are proudly being used, and I'm sure yeah. she handles. Karuna. She handles a lot. She handles yeah. it beautifully. Exactly, and I just shortlisted for the Booker. Right. So maybe things are changing and, and this is what I want to tell learners, you know, right. you do not have to be, you don't have to think it's a lesser form or a inferior form of language yeah. use, what we call Sri Lankan English. Yeah. Proudly our writers are using it. Not only are they using it, they're going right on top hmm. of the international writing world. 
Yeah, at the same time, I can understand why people say things like Sri Lanka English can he make a nake. Because we always in the research and when we talk about it, we highlight the differences. There is a stock of language that we share with all other Englishes. And it's not to undermine that that we highlight the others, but that is where our identity lies. Yes. You know, so that's why even when Kachru started to go back to the beginning, when Kachru started giving these labels, English, Sri Lankan English, Indian English, that is coming from the political climate, the language climate of that time. We needed to identify these as, you know, rich differences, culturally significant differences. So he gave the label. Now, of course, we are contesting these labels a little bit. That's why we say Sri Lankan Englishers. Again, again, yes. Yes. The more you label something, the more uh, it becomes limited. So we are actually further catering, no? Yeah, we are further catering. Not just word Englishers, but Sri Lankan English and Sri Lankan Englishers. Exactly, yeah. Okay, so we keep catering and still there are many who hold on to a center. And hold that as a standard. Exactly. So yes. By I, I'll finish now by just saying this thing, Ali, it's a very fine line that we tread, no, of telling people use um don't worry, just use something. And then if someone writes a book or we see a pride rice, happy pride rice that could even both of us would what the heck, you know? Yeah. So where does that like where would the is, is it a very subjective line? Something that we are willing to accept as being okay, this is a Sri Lankan way of using it. Or if I see a board saying fried rice, I'm like, if you're at official levels, you should at least check what you're doing. Like, for example, yes. if I see wrong English in a government board, it annoys me. Because I'm like, if you're at that level, it's your job to check. Yeah. You're not a learner. Learning, think- yeah, can't do the textbooks with wrong grammar or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I think I agree with you because if you're chatting to somebody and he says, in a natural course of a spontaneous conversation, he says, I like, I love fried rice, I, I don't eat fork. I don't have a problem. That's no, that, exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Whereas maybe 20 years ago, I might have laughed, you mm-hmm. know, so we also evolved. And I think I have evolved because English is much more, much more everywhere now. Bilingual uh, speakers of English and um, dominantly single speaking English speakers are much more I meet them much more and because because of the nature of our work I suppose so uh, as you say it can be quite subjective but at the same time as you said if I see a mistake like that in a textbook or in some you know some kind of teaching material or in a very important government uh, document that will pop up at me at uh, at me as a as, as an anomaly much more than if I hear it even like, you know, there are social media memes about, you know, how people misspell uh, words in uh, in shops. You know, you would have seen the one from Kilinochi that calls crabs crap. So you get devil crap, fried crap, curried crap, etc. And when people share this, I be- become this right pedantic uh, know-all and say, you know, this is from Kilinochi or somewhere. And it's a very common error where the phonology affects the, the spelling. And that has been studied. If you get it in, sing- in Chinese writing, etc. So that's why the per and the bur are interchangeable in uh, Tamil phonology. And uh, so it's quite natural. But at the same time, it's not a big deal because there's a picture of a crab, there's a picture of a curried crab and a devil crab. So nobody's going to think of it of being served rubbish instead of, uh, of the kakulua. Uh, but as you said, it's context. And context there are- also subjectivity of subjectivity as to how much that individual can handle it no exactly like what annoys you might not annoy me or what annoys so it's a very subjective thing yes i think it's social media where you get invite people to laugh at it yes and so, the another norm. Thing is, they are establishing exactly. the norm and social media can be a bit pernicious because it uh, it's a performance so i think a lot of people who say oh ha ha this is terrible and they uh, assign values to it saying oh this is the state of the country look at the state of the spelling therefore the state of the country kind of thing it's a performance because that person also might be saying crap uh, and uh, that person also might not be you know that fantastically good in english but that performance is sustained on the <laughs> on the me as a, on yes. the media it can yes. give a very uh, daunting message to someone who's learning the language. Exactly. 
So Dinali, I think our conversation didn't uh, solve any question, but showed the complexity of the thing, which is exactly, no, which is exactly what I wanted to show. Because neither of us, I mean, I certainly have no answer to this is how it should be. But to show yeah. the complexities and maybe what I tell others, if you are making mistakes in the process of learning, go ahead. Mm. But if you come to a level where you teach and you're writing books, then be careful. Because if you make mistakes, whatever, officially you might be propagating that. Having said that, I mean, there are African writers who wrote in in a very, it's not even pidgin, but broken English. We yeah, had one deliberate. writer, no? So all that. So to understand the complexity of what language learning is, to go away from the thought that there is one way of speaking English and if you're not at that level that you should be silent, not to go there. And also to people who, who might listen to us who might actually ridicule substandard English for them I say be careful it's very complex and maybe don't because there are a lot of other that was my lecture last time there are other historical factors would which would have made people not have access to good teaching even so all mm -hmm. that think of all that when you talk so Dinali thank you but I am going to come and ask you the same questions in Singhala and that will be my next we'll try to handle like words that we don't know because those are jargon, technically. Yes. Technically. And jargon, if, unless you have a glossary, and sadly, in the 1950s and 60s, there were glossary committees. I know because my father attended them. Right. But that kind of going, bringing one language up to the standard or the, needing the words of the other kind of fell by the wayside later. So that we are all stuck with jargon when we come to particular disciplines. Yeah. Right. Okay. So thank you. Very Thank much you. for your time, Dinali. And, Thank you, Madhu. Uh, and for clarifying one of the like earliest questions I wanted to deal with in this channel. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs>